junkies, welcome to this review of Still, a Michael J. Fox movie. This is a film about obviously the 80s idol and star Michael J. Fox who rose to fame on television with family ties uh, and then sort of hit the stratosphere with uh, Back to the Future and curiously around the same time Teen Wolf as well. Obviously Back to the Future spawned two more sequels, there were a couple of other sort of films out there, Secret of My Success and something else and something else but really Back to the Future was his kind of peak uh, and then he returned to television with Spin City. But perhaps the most notable thing beyond him being in Back to the Future uh, around Michael J. Fox's life and career is the fact that he was diagnosed with Parkinson's in his late 20s. And this documentary is about that. This documentary is a film, a very simply told film. Uh, it has a very simple talking head of Michael J. Fox. Um, you know, he has all of the sort of ticks and tremors. Uh, you know, there's no way you can conceal the extent to which Parkinson's, uh, you know, impacts his every move, his every statement, his every activity, if you like. It's interestingly voiced by him. I think it's voiced by him in those moments when he was taking the right drugs to kind of get his voice to a place where it wasn't sort of ticking. Um, it was an incredibly simple technique of a deep sort of deep focus kind of talking head. Um, they did a very neat thing where they had this sort of overlapping dialogue where he would say something, he would sit, he would look and his voice would come in underneath uh, a sort of shot that was held for longer. I thought what was clever about that was it kind of echoed the disjointedness of what he said, but it also allowed us to sort of look at him and look at his face and think about his feelings around some of the words that had come out before. It was quite, it was a very effective and unusual thing. I've not seen it done too often where, you know, he'd say something like I am now and then something else would come underneath whilst he just sort of sat there looking. Quite early on in the film, we establish, you know, the fact that it's, it's like one of those situations where you sort of foreground what this is about at the moment he kind of found out he had Parkinson's and then you spiral back and tell his life story. And so we have this incredibly effective sequence where he's actually with his physiotherapist and he's he's walking along the street in New York. He says hello to someone and he actually falls over. He actually collapses in the road. And, and the first thing you get about Michael J. Fox within this is he's not mawkish. He doesn't feel at all sorry for himself. He isn't self-pitying. He doesn't want pity. He's incredibly funny, whip smart, the master of the one liner, the master of the put down. And the thing I wasn't expecting with this documentary was how searingly honest it was going to be about himself, not just in terms of Parkinson's, which it is, but also in terms of how he didn't deal with his ascent to becoming such a sort of household name in, in a particularly nice way. So we look at the notion of celebrity, of spoiled celebrity, of ego and all that kind of stuff, which I wasn't expecting. So we walked through, oh, and also right at the front, we have this moment where he's lying in bed sort of further down in his career when success has struck. Uh, and he, we have this shot of his hand and we sort of see a moth or the, the sound of a moth or it's sort of like fluff, fl fluttering in front of his face and he starts to see that his finger starts to twitch. And this is obviously incredibly sort of symbolic for him because this must have been the first moment that he began to realise, hang on, there's something wrong here. There's something not quite right about my physicality. I think it's really interesting. It's called Still, a Michael J. Fox movie. What was really, really clever in the making of this film is that by the end of it, I think it's a good two hours in it. I felt like I'd watched another Michael J. Fox movie. I mean, my memories of Michael J. Fox, and I was talking about this to uh, the girls, was that he was um, he was a sort of actor. And bearing in mind, it's principally Back to the Future, which is where I kind of saw him, but also the TV shows. I remember them coming over and seeing him on those, especially Spin City and Family Ties. His manner, his physicality was always one of fidgeting and movement, you could say almost ADHD-like, where he was in a constant state of movement. He's rushing, he's in a constant rush to get to the next place. He's speedy, he's fast, he wants to get things done. Right down to, he would always have this characteristic sort of, he'd sort of skid into shot or he'd hop back or he'd run through a door backwards. He, and he, he was always moving and, and so still, the idea of being still, he was never still. And what becomes interesting is, is that whilst he was never still prior to his diagnosis of Parkinson's, once diagnosed with Parkinson's, he kind of couldn't be still. How do they establish the idea of a Michael J. Fox movie? They do this incredibly clever thing, which has been done before. This isn't novel. They completely committed to this device of, as he was talking about moments in his career, they would intercut uh, between certain moments and all of the kind of content that he'd done, the films, the kind of little known films that weren't particularly successful from all over his career uh, to lots of his kind of sitcoms, they would cut together moments that essentially echoed 
the real life moments that were happening in his life. Uh, there was a few bits of reconstruction, which I thought worked really well. You know, there were sort of like motifs of him sort of running down a corridor towards light. Sounds a bit cheesy in the description, not at all cheesy in the execution. Um, and and, and it, was, it was edited at pace. This charged along. And all the while you have his voiceover and you're returning to his uh, talking head uh, as he kind of gives you very, very small little pointers and, 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 and comments about himself, about his life and about how he was feeling. But there were as many moments in that talking head where it wasn't a talking head, it was just a head. It was just him looking and thinking. And his relationship with the director was so intimate that you could see the mutual respect that he had for the director and the knowingness and he respected how the director kind of got a sense of him and all this kind of stuff. So it painted a sense of era brilliantly. We moved through his early years, the classic story of, you know, who his parents were, how he had no money, how he wanted to become an actor, how his parents were like, yeah, right, you're never going to make it. He was down to his last dime, all that kind of stuff. And then eventually he was kind of making this film Teen Wolf um, and, uh, you know, and, and, he, and he discovered, uh, you know, after, after all of his TV stuff, he discovered whilst making Teen Wolf, they were making Back to the Future. And we've talked about it before. Originally an actor called Eric Stoltz was cast in Back to the Future. And for whatever reasons, it's disputed whether they didn't want Eric Stoltz or Eric Stoltz couldn't do it. Um, he essentially got asked in to do it. They, they originally Spielberg went to Family Ties to see if they could get Michael J. Fox. They said, no, we can't release him. And anyway, they made it work. But of course, he had to bounce between both productions. He was almost shooting 24 hour days. He was shooting at night uh, for Back to the Future and he was shooting throughout the day for his, his TV commitments. And so the whole film is shot through with this kinetic energy, the kinetic energy of his performances from his career, the kinetic energy of the editing and the pace with which this film was made. And of course, the curiously kinetic energy of his condition and his Parkinson's diagnosis. Threaded throughout, there are quite a few moments of him with his physiotherapist. Um, and these were incredibly tender, sensitive moments where his physio is trying to, you know, get him to do all these exercises, to keep practicing walking because he doesn't want to fall. You know, we discover within the film that he's fallen and broken his hand at one point. And we obviously we saw him fall right at the beginning on the streets of New York. Um, there's another time he talks about how he injured his face and have bolts put in his face because he fell over and smashed his face. Yeah, there's a great line where he says something like, you know, yeah, gravity is a thing even when you're this height. You know, he, he was famously very, very short. And, and again, it was sort of painted a really sort of, um, nostalgic portrait of the 1980s, how he came to fame and all the kind of premieres and everything he was going to and how, you know, he really was a big thing. And if you think about it, it was a big thing around a relatively a, a few kind of projects other than his TV stuff. He talked about how he met his wife. This was really nice. He talked really honestly about essentially what a wanker and an arsehole he became. You know, there was even footage, which is very rare to see, where he was sort of preparing for a take and he was on set and he was being really miserable and really stroppy and a proper ego with the production team. You know, he'd gone from like, you know, desperate to star in something to just taking it off granted because he was the wonder kid. He was the big star in town. He was the biggest name in Hollywood at that point. And he talks honestly about how it all went to his head. And so when he met his, his wife, who was also cast within the uh, sitcom that he was in, he said that he was, he said something about, I think a breath smelling of garlic. And she called him a complete fucking asshole and stormed off. And what I liked was that's the kind of turning point where you realise that Michael J. Fox, at the point that he was brought down a peg or two, not just in his career, but obviously eventually in terms of his health, is willing to acquiesce and accept and admit but essentially, he was a complete fucking arsehole, and he was. <laughs> he talked about how um, when he got his diagnosis, so, you know, eventually got his diagnosis, and he concealed it for something like seven years. Um, he talked about becoming addicted to alcohol. He said, I was definitely an alcoholic. He's been sober ever since, I think nearly 30 years now. Uh, he moved on to pills, and this is why he's concealing it all from the industry. And then upon diagnosis, someone suggested these pills, and you have these kind of rapidly cut sequences where he's taking pills to get him through scenes, but he only had a limited amount of time before those pills would stop working so you got 45 minutes in. and what was really good was they were showing us all these scenes and clips and moments from his tv series where you now know that behind his face he's going through the stress of concealing his parkinson's diagnosis and also you know much further on he talks about how when the tremor started to kick in especially around i think his left hand we had a long montage of all these scenes in which props would be placed in that hand he would conceal that hand he would use that hand in different ways and again this goes back to this idea of not being able to keep still 
His character, his persona, his star status was about movement, kinetic energy, franticness, frenzy, shaking, movement, nervous ticks, and all that kind of stuff, and how he managed to fold that in to his performance. There was even a moment where one of the kind of key aspects of Parkinson's is that a certain mask, a sort of rictus mask, kind of creeps across the face, the eyes become slightly inexpressive, uh, the face becomes quite straight. And he was saying, he said this really interesting thing where he said at one point when he saw himself on screen towards the end of, you know, after three or four years of having been diagnosed with Parkinson's, he thought, oh, that sort of slightly blank kind of inexpressive face is just me being, having got confident and calmer and better and more crafted, you know, I've, I've mastered my craft of acting more. But in fact, it was him getting iller. Uh, and, and more unable, actually, to express anything that he wanted to. So he saw it as kind of confidence. What he saw as confidence was actually a sign of him getting more and more ill. There was a great moment where he said that when he was diagnosed, he was handed a pamphlet uh, about Parkinson's and on the on the picture saying, this will change your life. This is, you know, the back in the day, the doctors were like, this is, this is it. This is a life sentence. You know, <laughs> this is going to be how you end your days. Um, and he looked at the piece of paper and he saw two smiling faces of a couple. And he said, well, when I looked at it, I couldn't really work out which one had been given this earth shattering news because they both look so happy you know very funny moments when someone i think his physio or someone asks him how's your wife uh, whilst he's doing some sort of stomach exercise or whatever he says you know married to me and then there's a great long pause still you know he understands he talks really sensitively about how in many regards it's so much easier for the ill person i think people who have who are carers will relate to this it's so much easier for the ill person because they're dealing with his, he's dealing with his illness but he says you know she's having to deal with everything around it the the setting the family you know he has three children there's some lovely moments between him and his kids his grown-up kids at home and again they're all incredibly it's a warm loving family but none of them are kind of on eggshells with him none of, none of them are giving him special treatment just because he's Michael J Fox and also just because he's got Parkinson's no he's almost you know it's almost sort of like that annoying guy who sat at the kind of breakfast counter who's kind of saying stuff then of course we get to the point where he talks about coming out with with Parkinson's and we have all this sort of material and footage uh, of him in chat shows and interviews about uh, what it means to have come out and how he carried on performing and you see him in Spin City. But none of this is done in a mawkish fashion. He owns it. He takes ownership of his narrative. He doesn't see himself as a victim. He's not a victim. He's taken control. This is an opportunity. There's a fascinating moment as well in the interview where obviously he's kind of fading. And what happens, there's moments where he's also recording the voiceover for this documentary. And obviously as the, the, the drugs wear off, his sort of inarticulacy increases, the ticks increase, increase, the shaking increases, and he becomes less able to be sort of coherent or present. And there's a moment in the interview where he says, I need to take my, I need to take my pills. And he says that he describes it to the family as if, you know, when he, you know, when he takes the pills, it's like waiting for a bus to come along. But then when the bus comes along, he says, when he takes his pills, he says, it's such a strange experience. He said, he almost feels like he is poured, his personality, his soul is poured back into his physical body and he's present again. And it's interesting, there's one moment where he does take the drugs and two minutes later, you suddenly hear how sort of cogent and coherent and more smoothly he can talk. I mean, for me, the thing that really kept crept through throughout all of this was how much of a hurry Michael J. Fox was always in. He couldn't stay still. You know, he had his greatest performances and things like Back to the Future and in his TV sitcoms and what have you. But his greatest performance, in a sense, is how he's managed to perform Parkinson's in a way. He's done it with dignity. He's done it with a lack of sort of, you know, self-pity. He's not asking anyone to say, you know, it's not poor me, poor me. He's present. He's pragmatic. He's incredibly funny, incredibly self-effacing, quite tough. You can tell he's quite a tough cookie. There's an incredibly tender moment where he's sat on the coast by the beach with his son and they're shot from behind looking out. So they're kind of silhouetted. Um, they're talking about how the son has kind of, you know, gets concerned about whether Michael J. Fox is going to hurt himself and how, you know, most people who don't want to sort of, you know, Michael J. Fox doesn't want to have to, doesn't want to have to accommodate the fact that he can't do what he wants to do. But of course, for the family, that's always a worry because it's like the family want to kind of look after him more and sort of make sure he doesn't fall. But for Michael J. Fox, he just wants to get places. He wants to do things. He doesn't want to sit still. And there's a moment where they reach over, they both hold hands. And at that point, the son is holding his hand and you can see that the shake is there but the shake slows down. And for me, it was such a wonderfully tender moment. This film is all about movement. It's really interesting. It's all about an inability to control movement. You know, his career moved at a sort of frantic, frenetic, kind of kinetic pace. 
his physicality and his performances was very sort of on edge and nervy and kind of sort of ticky and kind of, you know, and that's what his charm was. That he was a sort of cheeky kid, you know, da, 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 da. You know, if you think of his Marty McFly in, in Back to the Future, that's exactly what he was like. Um, and then, of course, he gets this condition, which means he can't help but move. And yet, even within all these kind of judders and movements and shudders of Parkinson's, he's desperately wanting to move. He, I mean, in all of his physio clips, he's wanted to get to the end of a corridor or a road faster than the physio says he should. You know, he needs to master things. And when he falls, the idea that he keeps falling and hurting himself again is because he's in this huge, huge rush. This is a non-gloopy portrait of Michael J. Fox. You know, I, I think that Michael J. Fox's greatest performance in many regards is quite possibly the way in which he has dealt with his diagnosis. I found it incredibly interesting, informative. I know some reviews have said, okay, it doesn't give you, it doesn't tell you too much, but actually I think it gives you everything you need to know about Michael J. Fox. I could have watched him just sitting, listening to questions from the director as more, if, if you like, than necessarily hearing him answer. There is so much going on in there, so much going on in his head. A lot didn't need to be said to get across how much inner strength this, this familiar face, this household name has had to muster in order to keep moving. <laughs>